Good morning. morning. It's great to see you all here this 11th Sunday of the Pentecost season. Welcome to Faith Lutheran. Um, I have a couple of announcements for you this morning. Um, The first is the most exciting, um, that Faith Fair is finally here this Saturday. Um, I'm so excited because, yeah, I am. I'm really excited because I have no idea what it's all about. So I'm really anxious to see what goes on for the day. But um, it is not too late to bring things or to volunteer, correct, Sarah? Um, And if you're available to volunteer, they'll be setting up as early as 2 o'clock on Friday through 6 o'clock, and then 7 o'clock on Saturday morning. So if you have a little bit of time to spare, We'd love to have you. Um, we'd love to have you come and volunteer. So um, bring friends, bring family, bring um, your dogs, bring I don't know. Bring, so just bring everybody because it sounds like an exciting day. Um, and then the second thing is in your bulletin today, you should see. Well, now I have to get it. A form like this it should be in the center of your bulletin. Um, one of the things I've noticed when I came on board was that I would start to go out and visit people and realize that I have a P.O. box number for you um, and not an address, and that a lot of the phone numbers were incorrect because many of us are using cell phones and not landlines. So if you would do our church a favor so we can update all of our records, if you would fill that form out and either give it to me as you leave or put it on the back table as you leave, we're going to update everybody's information um, so that we're, we're ready to go. Um, so we'll be handing out these forms over the next couple of weeks. Um, if you've already filled it out, just, just ignore it. But if you haven't filled it out, please, please do that as well. Um, and you'll be doing me a great favor there. Um, and, and that's all the announcements I have. Are there any announcements that... Barbara? Oh, yeah. She's published her first book. Sarah Cornell has published her first book. And what's it called? Attracts, Hunting Her, House, and a Famous Power. Wow, so it's a story about a particular house and its history and lots of good pictures. What's that? It's her childhood home. Oh, it's her childhood home. Wow. That's really cool, yeah. I know. Congratulations, Sarah. That's awesome. Any other any other announcements? Have grandma tickets if anybody's interested in the quilt. After worship? Yep. So Peg has raffle tickets for the quilt that's being raffled off on Saturday. Um, so if you'd like to purchase some today, Peg's available after worship. And that's it, I think. We'll begin our worship. If you will, please rise as you are able. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the God of manna, the God of miracles, the God of mercy. Amen. Drawn to Christ and seeking God's abundance, let us confess our sin. God, our provider, help us. It is hard to believe there is enough to share. We question your ways when they differ from the ways of the world in which we live. We turn to our own understanding rather than trusting in you. We take offense at your teachings and your ways. Turn us again to you. Where else can we turn? Share with us the words of eternal life and feed us for life in the world. Amen. Beloved people of God, In Jesus, the manna from heaven, you are fed and nourished. By Jesus, the worker of miracles, there is always more than enough. Through Jesus, the bread of life, you are shown God's mercy. You are forgiven and loved into abundant life. Amen. Amen.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. immeasurable love. You place your gifts before us. We eat and are satisfied. Fill us in this world in all its need with the life that comes only from you through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. first reading is from Exodus chapter 16. The whole congregation of the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, If we only had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots and ate our fill of bread, for you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, I am going to bring bread from heaven for you, and each day the people shall go out and gather enough for that day. In that way I will test them, whether they will follow my instruction or not. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of the Israelites, Draw near to the Lord, for he has heard your complaining. And as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of Israelites, they looked toward the wilderness, and the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. The Lord spoke to Moses and said, I have heard the complaining of the Israelites. Say to them, At twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you should have your fill of bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening quails came up and covered the camp. And in the morning, there was a layer of dew around the camp. 
And when the layer of dew lifted, there, on the surface of the wilderness, was a fine, flaky substance, as fine as frost on the ground. When the Israelites saw it, they said to one another, What is this? What is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, It is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. This is the word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. We'll read Psalm 78 responsibly. So God commanded the clouds above and opened the doors of heaven. Raining down the heaven upon to eat and giving them rain from heaven. So mortals ate the bread of angels. God provided for them food enough. The Lord calls the east wind to blow from the heavens, and the power of the south winds up wind. Raining down flesh upon them like dust and flying birds, like the sand of the seas. Letting them fall in the midst of the camp, and around the dwellings. So the people ate and were well filled, for God gave them what they craved. I don't have the beginning yet. Oh, no, no, I see, I see. No, sorry. Sorry about that. Uh, the second reading is from Ephesians 4. I, therefore, the prisoner in the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. But each of us was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it is said, when he ascended on high, he made ca captivity itself a captive. He gave gifts to his people. When it says he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is the same one who ascended far above all the heavens so that he might fill all things. The gifts he gave were that some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, to equip the saints for the work of the knowledge of the Son of God to maturity, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. We must no longer be children tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery, by their craftiness and deceitful scheming, but speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by every ligament with which it is equipped, as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth in building itself up in love. The word of God, the word of life. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. <laughs> Shall we go? You have the word. 
Holy Gospel, according to John, the sixth chapter. When the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were beside the sea, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum looking for Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? And Jesus answered them, Very truly I tell you, you are looking for me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For it is on him that God the Father has set his seal. They said to him, What must we do to perform the works of God? And Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him who he has sent. So they said to him, What sign are you going to give us then, so that we may see it and believe in you? What work are you performing? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written, He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us that bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise the Lord Christ. Please be seated. And it's time for the children's sermon. So if they have any kids out there that want to come up. Come on, JJ. Come on up. Grab a seat. There you go. How are you today? Thanks for coming up. So I brought, I brought this loaf of bread with me. Pretty cool, isn't it? And I brought it because in our gospel this morning, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. What does that mean? Crazy stuff, right? Jesus isn't bread really, is he? And then I got to thinking, why did Jesus call himself the bread of life? I mean, why did he call himself the french fry of life? Right? Or maybe the candy of life. I love candy, don't you? So, like, why not, or why not the sirloin steak of life? Why do you think he called himself the bread of life? So, it's crazy, isn't it? Here's what I think, though. I think he called himself the bread of life because whether or not you know this, everybody all over the world eats bread. Did you know that? Some kind of bread. It may not look like this loaf. It may look like very dark colored bread. It may be flat bread like a pita or a naan. But everybody across the world eats some kind of bread. That's kind of cool, isn't it? And so I think Jesus picked something that everybody could relate to. Everybody knew about bread. Some kind of bread anyway. And everybody knew that bread was something that nourishes us. Something important that we need so that we stay alive and stay healthy, right? And so Jesus compared himself to bread. Because unlike french fries, you can't find them all over the world, can you? No. But bread you can. And you can find Jesus all over the world, in all cultures of the world. And, well, Jesus didn't call himself the candy of life, because candy really doesn't nourish us, does it? It's pretty junky food when you think about it. It's filled with, filled with sugar. And he didn't call himself the sirloin steak of life, because not everybody can afford sirloin steak, can they? That's expensive for some of us. But everybody can have bread, and everybody can have Jesus in their life. That's a pretty cool thing, isn't it? Yeah. Let's give thanks for it, shall we? Dear God, we believe in Jesus, the bread of life, 
the bread that nourishes our hearts and our souls and gives us faith. And so help us, Lord, whenever we eat bread, to remember Jesus, the bread of life. In your name we pray. Amen. So I'm going to give you a loaf of bread. And when you eat it today, share it with your family. And when you do, tell them about Jesus, who is the bread of life. Okay? All right. Thanks for coming up, guys. You're welcome. So everybody got a snack bag when they came in, right? So it tells me that maybe you're crazy for cheese curls or you're passionate about popcorn or you're nuts about nuts. What you snack on says something about who you are. At least that's what Alan Hirsch, the neurological director of the Smell and Taste Treatment and Research Foundation in Chicago says. He had 800 volunteers take a personality test, and then ask them after they took the test to name their favorite snacks. He reported the results in the Journal of Alternative Medicine in May of 2007. And, and they were kind of astounding, actually. Because people who share a personality type tend to choose the same snack 95% of the time. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? In her alternative medicine article called Message in the Munchies, Lisa Turner said that there's meaning in the types of munchies that we like to munch. So I thought maybe it would be fun to test it out today, right? Okay, so you, you got a snack that maybe it wasn't your favorite munchie, but it was the favorite one that was offered you, right? So when I, when I call on something, I want you to raise your hand if this is your favorite munchie. How many of you like tortilla chips? A couple, okay. So if you like tortilla chips, according to this research, you are a perfectionist. You're successful, you're ambitious, you like to plan ahead. Final piece of the puzzle. <laughs> there you go, that's about it. You have a strong sense of social responsibility and you abhor justice. Does that, does that fit some of you? There you go, okay. How many of you are pretzel lovers? Okay, we have a couple here. You're the life of the party. You love novelty, and you can quickly become bored with routine. You tend to start new projects before you ever finish the last one. There you go. I know there are some cheese curls people here. Anybody a cheese curl? The, oh, Joyce, right. And she taught me something. Did you know if you eat 10 cheese curls before you go to bed, you sleep better because there's melatonin in them? I'm telling you, that's what Joyce told me. But if you like cheese curls, you have a high sense of ethics and morals, and you insist on treating everyone fairly. You might seem uptight, but you're highly organized and very methodical. There you go. She's saying it fits. How about popcorn? Anybody love popcorn? Oh, there you go. A couple of them. You're a take charge type, but with modest, low-key demeanor. You're confident, but you're reserved. You would make a large charitable donation without ever telling anyone. There you go. How many of you are nuts about nuts? All right, All right. well, you're even-tempered. You're easy to get along with, and you're highly empathic. Your easygoing and cooperative nature contributes to success at home and at work. Okay, this is mine. Potato chips? Oh, yes. You're achievement-oriented, successful, and competitive. You're a natural leader, but can easily be irritated with the inconveniences of life, like long lines and traffic jams. There you go, that's me. How about crackers? Anybody love crackers? There, okay, so some over here. You're contemplative, thoughtful, and often a loner. You prefer private time and shy away from confrontation and arguments. You can't stand to hurt another person's feelings. And the last one I'll give you. How many of you like meat snacks? Like beef jerky and things like that. Paul, oh, there you go. You're gregarious and generous, and you tend to be loyal to a fault. 
Was it, was it pretty true about your, the snacks you like? It's, it's unbelievable, isn't it? Well, Jesus runs into some snack lovers today in our text, which picks up off of last week's text. Last week we learned that Jesus had just fed 5,000 people with five barley loaves and two fish. It's the next day that we're here today, and the crowd, recognizing that Jesus is no longer among them, follows him across the sea to Capernaum. And, and when they kind of confront Jesus, he says to them, Very truly, I tell you, you are not looking for me because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. So what does this particular bread craving say about these people in the crowd? Well, maybe that they're just enthusiasts. They're people whose basic desire is to be satisfied and content, to have their needs met by Jesus. Afraid of being deprived, they want more than anything to maintain their happiness and avoid missing out on worthwhile possibilities and experiences and keep themselves excited and occupied. But there's a problem with that personality type. Because Jesus warns them, do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. According to Jesus, the barley loaves he used to feed the 5,000 are food that perishes. And he tells the people that they shouldn't focus their enthusiasm on that kind of bread. Instead, they should be working for food that lasts forever. Because Jesus knows that those loaves that he multiplied are going to be eaten and the people will still be hungry the next day. And he knows that any water that he turns into wine is going to be consumed and the people at the wedding feast will still want more. And he knows that any paralytic that he heals will grow old enough that they will become crippled again. And any dead child that he raises to new life is going to grow up and die of natural or other causes. Jesus knows that miracles are tricky because they make a really big impression and then they disappear. They don't last forever. And Jesus doesn't want us to feast on a steady diet of miracles because they don't provide complete nutrition in and of themselves. They're the cheese curls and the popcorn and the peanuts of life, of Christian life. They're a tasty snack, but they are not a life-changing meal. As a mother of our three children, Mitch and I provided for all of their physical needs. We fed them, we clothed them, we gave them warm beds, we paid for college and helped them to get started in the world. But in truth, their needs were so much deeper than those physical needs. They wanted to be loved. They wanted to be held. They wanted to play. They wanted to have a desire for knowledge. They hungered for new experiences. In short, they desired a quality of life and not just mere existence. And that's what Jesus provides for us. A quality of life. A way to get beyond mere existence and experience life and an intensity of life that we've never before experienced. An old man goes to the diner every day for lunch. He orders soup, and, and it's the soup of the day every day. One day, the manager asks him as he's leaving how his meal was. And the old man replies, it was good, but you could give a little more bread. Two slices of bread is not enough. So the next day, the manager tells the waitress to give him four slices of bread. And when he finishes his meal and he's checking out, he asks him, how's your meal today, sir? And he says, well, it was good, but you could give a little more bread. So the next day, the manager tells the waitress, give him eight slices of bread. So she gives him eight slices of bread, and he eats his soup, and he, and he eats the bread, and he comes to pay, and the manager asks him, how was your meal today, sir? And he said, it was good, but you couldn't 
give a little more bread. And so the manager, getting really frustrated with this response and not being able to satisfy him, tells the waitress, tomorrow, give him the entire loaf, 16 pieces of bread. And so he does. Eats the meal, eats the soup, eats the bread. And as he comes out, the manager says, so how was your meal today, sir? And he says, it was good, but like every day, you could give a little more bread. So the manager is now obsessed with making this customer happy. And so he goes to the local bakery, and he has them bake a six-foot loaf of bread. He and his waitress, before the man comes in, cut the bread in half, butter it on both halves of it, and when the man comes in, they serve him the soup of the day and the whole six-foot loaf on the countertop, laying it right there beside his soup. The old man sits down and he devours his soup and the entire six-foot loaf of bread. Now the manager knows that he has finally satisfied this customer. He's given him what he's been looking for. And so when he comes up to pay, he says, well, sir, how was your meal today? And the man says, I'm telling you, it was good as usual, but I see you're back to serving only two slices of bread. <laughs> Does it sound like us? <laughs> Do we find ourselves asking for more all the time, searching for something that will fill and satisfy us? Are we eating tons of munchies and forget about what really fills our souls? Are we expecting more bread and forgetting that it's not about the bread we get? It's about the bread itself. Are we really looking for more bread? Or are we looking for more Jesus? Jesus realizes that. And so he offers us the bread that has come down from heaven. Jesus himself. The good stuff. Part of a perfectly balanced spiritual diet that gives new and eternal life. What he's saying is that while life, in its most elementary form, depends upon bread, bread can only sustain life. It cannot make life what God intends it to be. The bread in our consumer society that we are fed every day has power, but its power will fail. Because the kind of bread that our consumer-oriented society tells us to strive for can buy us land, but it cannot buy us love. It can buy bonds, but it can't buy brotherhood. It can buy gold, but it can't buy gladness. Silver, but not sincerity. It can buy hospitals, but it can't buy health. It can buy three-carat rings, but not character. It can buy houses, but not homes. To satisfy your hunger, you cannot feast on the bread of the earth. You need the bread from God. And that bread is Jesus, the one who comes down from heaven to give us life. A bread nourishes us physically. Jesus nourishes us spiritually. In one of her books, Mother Teresa wrote this, the spiritual poverty of the Western world is much greater than the physical poverty of third world countries. You in the West have millions of people who suffer such terrible loneliness and emptiness. They feel unwanted and unloved. These people are not hungry in a physical sense, but they are in another way. They know they need something more than money, yet they don't know what it is. And then she goes on to write, what they are missing really is a loving relationship with God. Today, you will come to this communion table for bread, which is the bread of heaven, broken and offered to us, more than enough to satisfy our deepest hungers and hopes, it is not snack food that we eat and still find ourselves unsatisfied and hungry for more. 
And that is the significance of the bread that we share in this sacrament of communion. We have bread. We have each other. We have Jesus here with us. May we never take that sacrament or Jesus for granted. For through it, we receive the bread of life. Amen. Amen. Join me in professing our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, He rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of the last. Amen. Calling on the spirit of wisdom to guide our hearts and our minds, let us pray for the church, the world, and all in need. O wise one, your wisdom has been present in this world since its beginning. Pour out your wisdom into the hearts of the whole church, especially the newly baptized, lay leaders, deacons, pastors, and bishops. Merciful God, Merci, our prayer. 
Holy God of all creation, you are the source of all life. Where the sun blazes hard and strong, bring a gentle breeze. In the places experiencing the cold of winter, bring your warmth. Merciful God, Compassionate God, help government leaders of this world unite us for peace and justice. Humble all who hold authority, that power is directed toward a more just society. Merciful God, Bread of life from heaven, you feed us. Fill all who hunger with needed nutrition and open our hearts to eliminate hunger in this world. May we see a day where all are fed. Use us to share your healing power with those who are sick in mind, body, or spirit, especially Tom, Valerie, Pastor Michael, Nancy, Artie, Dick, Ron, Phyllis, Jim, Bob, Mike, Janet, Billy, Rosemary, Debbie, Shirley, Philip, Tom, Jack, Gail, Bob, Jim, Jen, Rachel, Judy, Diane, Donna, Roger, Cheryl, Hope, the Congregation of Hope, Brenda, Nikki, Pat, and those who name aloud or silently in our hearts. Merciful God, O oh, wisdom of truth, help us to understand your will for the church. Be with congregations experiencing transition, redevelopment, and the exciting yet frightening path of newness. May your wisdom be found at every step. Merciful God, our redeeming God, we give you thanks for the lives and witnesses of your saints now departed. Bring your beloved into eternal glory, opening wide the gates to the heavenly banquet. Merciful God, we lift up these prayers to you, gracious God. Receive them into your holy keeping. Amen. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. Please share those words of peace with each other.
Let us pray. Jesus, bread of life, you have set this table with your very self and called us to the feast of plenty. Gather what has been sown among us and strengthen us in this meal. Make us be what we receive here, your body, for the life of the world. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And all Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, Almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. merciful God. You are most holy, and great is the majesty of your glory. You so loved the world that you gave your only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. We give you thanks for his coming into the world to fulfill for us your holy will, and to accomplish all things for our salvation. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim Jesus' death until he comes again. Christ, Christ has died, Christ, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Remembering therefore his salutary command, his life-given passion and death, his glorious resurrection and ascension, and the promise of his coming again. We give thanks to you, O Lord God Almighty, not as we ought, but as we are able. We ask you mercifully to accept our praise and thanksgiving, and with your word and Holy Spirit bless us, your servants, and these your own gifts of bread and wine, so that we and all who share in the body and blood of Christ may be filled with heavenly blessing and grace, and receiving the forgiveness of sin, may be formed to live as your holy people and be given our inheritance with all your saints. To you, O God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be our honor and glory in your holy church, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, we pray as our Lord taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And leave us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, 
forever and ever. Amen. Christ has set the table with more than enough for all. Come.
body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Amen. bread of life. We have received from your table more than we could ever ask. As you have nourished us in this meal, now strengthen us to love the world with your own life. In your name we pray. Amen. As you go on your way, may Christ go with you. May he go before you to show you the way, behind you to encourage you, beside you to befriend you, above you to watch over, and within you to give you peace. Amen. Go in peace. Right.